and Arthur Solomon with the Solomon Group. And today we're privileged to have Dr. Julius Bailey here. We're going to have an amazing conversation with him. Stay tuned. Here we got to say, Arthur, go ahead and take it away. Thank, thank you guys for tuning in today. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share this video. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. Uh, Dr. Bailey, he's a living legend. He's uh, done so many things. Um, he was an administrator. He's an author. He's a philosopher. He's a professor at Wittenberg University, a community activist, and maybe a governor in 2022. We'll see what happens. So, sorry, we're just sharing the post real quick. Um, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm grateful to have have your presence today here today. I appreciate you, brother. Good to see you, and good to see you too, man. I'm excited. A little nervous, man. Y'all make me nervous, <laughs> man, but I'm excited to be here on your show and, and continue to uh, support all the wonderful things you do for our area. Likewise. Well, the whole objective of this, we want to talk about the criminal justice reform. I know it's not real estate related, but this is something that mm -hmm. I'm passionate about. I know you, you've dedicated your whole life to criminal justice mm -hmm. reform, and and we thought maybe you could speak on your experience, maybe talk about Wittenberg and coming to Springfield and your experience so far, and maybe we can dive deep into the criminal justice side. No, that's fair. I mean, I think um, um, when you think about the work that I've done, um, I think chiefly um, I come from a background that um, looks at social justice in a very hands-on kind of way, right? And so I think it was the, even the Bible that tells you, you know, you got to love and give charity, but it also says to go visit those who are in prison, right? And so for me, understanding the relationship between those who are in prison and the relationship between what society's responsibility is to ensure that the folk don't go to prison sure. becomes sort of a two-pronged kind of way in which I approach things. And so since uh, maybe, what, 2005, um, I've probably visited, you know, 40 or 50 prisons uh, wow. in, in, in Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana. Um, and with these visits, generally they're around positive speaking and motivational stuff. And sometimes, you know, because of the nature of who I am, I build relationships with wardens and directors of prisons and have conversations because as, as, as you can imagine, over these years, you see changes in the, in the prisons, right? You see some administrations who, who support the rehabilitation aspect, others who put more money into the corrections aspect. And then what becomes the residual effect of those within prisons become something that I'm concerned about. The one thing I always say to those people, to, you know, to, to, to the offenders in there, I say, listen, I operate under the understanding that you'll be coming home soon, right? So I need to know that we're doing whatever we can do as a society to get you prepared for release, right? Yeah, what's the positivity there? Well, right, what's the positivity yeah. there, right? And so I always say, you know, it's, it's, it's what uh, uh, a ludicrous had, a, had an album called Release Therapy, right? Okay. And so we need to be about the release therapy of our inmates. And so that's at that level. I think for me, um, so to make it, make it very concise, I think my, my overall philosophy of criminal justice, and especially reform, has to do around three areas. I think one, it is to understand that we as a society need to operate on hope, right, and not fear. I think too many of us fear people. Too many of us fear our own communities, fear our own blocks. Uh, too, too many of our states and our communities fear its own citizens. And I think we need to operate on hope and not fear. I think, I think the second piece to operate on, as we talked about before, is looking at individuals' potential and their actual skills. Right? What are their actual skills and what are their potential skills? But we tend to be too locked into their past. Right? Mm. And so we can't be a, a, a nation, let alone a state, that concerns itself about the welfare of people if we're constantly bringing up the past and not allowing them to serve their time, not allowing them to, to sort of do their penance, you know, from that perspective, but you're locking into what you might have done. I think thirdly, which all kind of brings it all under one overarching uh, element, is that we need to invest in human capital, mm -hmm. right? So you're an investor, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. We need to invest in human capital as opposed to the, the, the mantra around safe streets, right? I'm not against safe streets, 
But I'm also, I think about it, you know, I'm a philosopher, right? So I think, what is the veracity of that, right? How safer are you today than you said that term 10 years ago? Right. Or 20, you're saying the same things you said 10 or 20 years ago. And meanwhile, you haven't invested in anybody's life. You're just invested in criminal justice, trying to get more police, trying to get more incarceration, trying to get more time, but yet you don't feel more safe or you don't feel less unsafe. You see what I'm saying? So if, if in fact you aren't, you, you aren't uh, uh, um, reaping what you're at least trying to sow intellectually, it's time for change here. And so that's why most of my life, uh, uh, especially in the last 20 years, have been around trying to create uh, communities to have conversations around uh, reforming criminal justice. Well, that's, <clears throat> and that's kind of where we're going. So can you give me your take on the criminal justice reform that you'd like to see in Ohio, some different programs that we can implement today? Um, Right. No, that's that would a good make question. a huge difference. So, 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 so back when I first came to Ohio, so I, I've been in Ohio since 2008, right? I've been in Ohio since, since 2008, uh, and I've been really working with the state of Ohio since 2010, right? And so in 2010, I started working both in Cuyahoga County uh, as well as some areas in Montgomery County, uh, working with what we know now as called Ban the Box, right? And so for about four years, I was working you know, on the ground, in communities, doing legislative work, trying to push both in Cuyahoga, uh, in, in Cuyahoga and uh, in Montgomery, working with those activists and those legislators to do the work and banning the box. Well, we know in 2016, John Kasich did actually sign the ban the box deal, a uh, uh, bill, which for me, it becomes important. And for um, brothers and sisters out in Ohio becomes important. Other states have done it, but what is ban the box if you didn't know? Ban the box means up until 2016 uh, uh, in the state of Ohio, um, anybody, especially states, because that's where it ended up going, but anybody who's an employer can ask you, have you ever been convicted of a felony, right? Well, now because of this bill and because of the work that a lot of hardworking people, and I just kind of joined the bandwagon for three, four years, have put forth, now at least uh, the bill that passed in 2016 was that, listen, state and public employees, employers, cannot ask that question, right? So right now, if you were to go and apply for a state job, you won't see the question, have you been convicted of a felony, mm -hmm. right? That's been the box. Now, obviously, it doesn't have its shortcomings. Sure it does, right? Because then it gives provisions for them to ask you at the point of hiring. Well, we're about to do a background check. Right. Right? Or they ask, okay, well, uh, obviously, it doesn't apply to private companies. Right? Which maybe, maybe it's right. Maybe a, a, a public government shouldn't force private people to do what they want to do in their private businesses. Maybe that's the case. But that's why people like us need to promote to business owners, listen, invest in human capital. Well, yeah, and we, what we were talking about earlier, um, before we even started this podcast, we were talking about the people who are getting those skills while they're in, yes. you know, in jail. They're, uh, the people who are coming out as, as almost master chefs. Yes. You know, these people are highly skilled. Yes. You know, and, and all they need is a chance to prove chance. it outside of the box. Right, you know, so. right, right. And I work, and I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to say this, like, because I'm, you know, those of you who know me, me from, from my work at, at, at Wittenberg University, like, I love my institution, right? But I'll put pressure on your alma mater, right? And I'll, I'll put pressure on them. I look, look, we have people like myself. Uh, we have another philosopher. We have a sociologist. We got a historian. We got an English professor that's doing work in the prisons every day, right? We have a sister in sociology, Brooke Wagner, doing good work with our, our, our juveniles, um, the justice folk here in Clark County. We got, you know, Lori Asklin. We got Nancy McHugh. We have myself doing work in state prisons across uh, uh, Ohio. When I go into these prisons 15, 20 times a year, and I say, listen, I'm here to work for you. And, yet they, and then they ask me, uh, 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 Professor Bailey, so when I get out, can I holler at you for a job, right? I need to know that I'm doing the work to say I need to help you, right? So if I work at a school that says we're not going to hire ex-offenders, then I feel like I'm being hypocritical, mm. right? And I can't, and, and you want, these people want people like me to go in there and inspire inmates. But you can't inspire them because they're thinking, I'm trying to speak release therapy, but if they have nothing on the outside to be released to, then that's how you get recidivism. That's how you get lack of morale. So, 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 so institutions like my university, businesses like you, we, and we were talking about Edwin's in Cleveland, 
right? Mm-hmm. And we're saying that Absolutely. restaurant is an important restaurant. And there's probably more. I, I'm just familiar with Ed, right. Ed, Edwin's. Edwin's is a high-level French restaurant that also just uh, built a, uh, a sandwich shop. And they hire exclusively uh, ex-offenders. They, they put their investment in the human capital because one thing, A, they have the skill. Right. Right? Right. B, we know they got the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and see, they, they need the job, and they're used to working. Right? Sure. So they've been working eight, ten hours in, in, in a joint. Right? So, so what does it mean to come work? So I think when, when, when we have employers, you can't tell me that I can be a janitor at, 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 at Chillicothe pri- uh, Prison for seven years, but yet I can't work at Wittenberg University in, 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 in your janitorial department? And I've been cleaning floors and cleaning right. bathrooms. What do you mean I can't work there? You know, I've been doing, uh, uh, hosting uh, people and, 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 and walking visitors like Professor Bailey through the institution, and, and my warden trusts me to, to, to walk across the univ- you know, to walk across the institution and, and host our guests, but yet I can't be a host at a hotel? Mm-hmm. Yet I can't be a host at a restaurant, right? So we have to change the mindset, and I think that's what Band the Box did, right? Is hopefully, and then I, I think the second program um, that I'm proud of that just literally just uh, got um, passed is the idea around cash bail reform, right? And that becomes sort of a preemptory to prison, right? That means to say I get arrested on June 10th. Uh, now it's July 24th, and I'm still in jail. I ain't got a trial yet. Okay, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know when I'm going to trial because of COVID. You know what I'm saying? I'm stuck, in, I'm stuck in county jail for months and months, you know, and I have no way out. Right. Right? So now I may have went in on a weed charge. I may have went in on an assault charge like every kid do getting a fight at McDonald's, right? But now because I don't have $10,000 cash on a $100,000 bond, I'm stuck in the county jail. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm just a kid who had a fight. I'm just a 22-year-old that, right. that, 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 that made a mistake when I was drunk or, 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 or had some weed or some whatever, whatever. And now I'm here and I'm stuck. And, wh- and, wh- and what do we know that happens? When you get into the prison system, you then have to adapt with prison culture. Right. I don't care who you are. And what happens now, you get the kid who's a good kid, the young adult who's a good young adult who now have to basically live and survive in these type of circumstances, waiting what? On trial, right? Can't control yeah. when the trial is. They don't have the money to buy a good lawyer to push it forward, so they're just waiting and waiting and waiting. Meanwhile, they have a fight with the inmate. And meanwhile, they got caught up in a, a, a situation, you know, trying to protect a friend at the, at the sure. institution. Now they got an internal case, which even if I get found not guilty or, 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 or charges discharged uh, at my, when, when I finally go to trial, well, you caught a case in prison, so you still got three years. Right? So we have to be about, so in July uh, of 2020, you just passed, um, the, uh, the state uh, passed Rule 46. It was some adjustments to Rule 46. Now, Rule 46 is pretty much a national um, rule. I mean, it's a it's a criminal court rule, right? So, in any court in America, now if you're watching Law and Order, you you say, uh, Judge, you want a Rule 46 hearing, right? That kind of thing, right? So, what that that, that pretty much uh, says is that listen, uh, um, we need to have a conversation about the bail, right? And so, when we have a conversation about bail, then the question becomes, well, how much is the bail for this kid? How much is the bail for this woman who was trying to protect her her children? How much is the bail for this person who had a fight? Oh, this bail is uh, uh, uh you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Five thousand. I work third shift at Dairy Queen. Right. That's that's wild. I'm I'm stuck in here over a fight. And and, and what do we know, Solomon? We know that's gonna she's gonna lose a Dairy Queen job whenever she gets out. Yeah. She's gonna probably and depending on what her children's situation is, she might lose her kids. Even if she's found not guilty, because she's been absent from her kids. Right. Right. Then let alone whatever the family structure is, male female gonna lose that. And you're going to tell me it's worth it, right? So I'm, I'm proud of that. We still have a lot of, 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 of dissenters in Ohio. And so there's a lot of still rules around it. People are worried, well, you just can't let criminals out. Well, we have to change what things mean, right? So, for instance, uh, um, class four and five uh, felonies, right? Low-level felonies with drug charges, right? You get a class four or five felony, you know, up into this, you know, Rule 46 piece. You know, you say, listen, wh- what do we do with that? Well, you have a mandatory sentence of X, Y, and Z, right? Well, we need to be about the business of changing some of those low-level, nonviolent drug offenses 
changing those into what the state of Ohio calls these sort of um, statutory uh, um, um, sort of unclassified misdemeanors. Right? So now the judge has the ability to say, well, you know what? We're going to give you, you know, drug court or we're going to give you uh, probation outside of the, you know, outside of prison or, you know, that kind of thing. Right? So, because why? And, I, and, I, and I'll close this and we can come to the next question. Why? Because I think what we as a society need to understand, when going back to my three, you know, my three principles, hope over fear, a potential over, uh, over past, and human capital over safe streets uh, mantra, I think we have to ask ourselves this. What do we think of when we think of felon? Because, right? again, a felon is a statutory term. Right. Right? A felon is a, a legal term that the state of Ohio could change today. If, if enough people in the Senate that says we're going to change what it means to be a felon, right? Now that changes. But the question is, they can change it through Rule 46. They can change it through ban the box. They can change it through anything that, that, that people like me to push forth and other people push forth. But the question is, are they, are they, are they going to change it in your heart? Are they going to change it in your heart? And so until we push people to understand that we need to deal with the human capital of people and the hearts of people, then now the felony that we're checking off or we're asking the person, have you ever had a felony? What? Well, now you have people scared to even say yes or no. Absolutely. It, for example, so so I'm a business owner, mm -hmm. and I work with OSC, Bob Mims, and 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 the guys over there. They're great. Um, like if I'm a business owner, and I want to say I'm listening to the podcast right now, and I'm saying to myself, I want to invest in human capital. Mm -hmm. I want to be a part of the change that I want to see. How? What resources are available right now here in Clark County and in Ohio to get? For example, I'm in real estate, right. in construction, all these different things. What can people do now to get connected in in my line of business, for example, if I'm an investor right. or I'm, I'm in a construction business? What's the best way to be able to reach the, the people that are coming out from those kind of situations that need a chance? That's a good question. So I think um, uh, in, in many of our counties, you, uh, you do have some level of, of, um, of sort of ex-offender sort of avoiding reentry programs. Right. You do have some level of those. Uh, Montgomery County has a robust one. Clark County has a couple of your of your halfway houses and those transitional spots and that kind of thing. Right. Um, those obviously are places where, where human capital can be tapped. Uh, we obviously have the um, the, um, the 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 OIC of Clark County, you know, that we certainly need to invest more in and to to make sure we invest in the in the skills of these people so they can have access to them. Uh, I think, but, but but really it starts, you know, it really starts with, with you as a business owner and me as a business owner and me working for institutions to say, listen, I'm making it a fundamental rule that we have to hire certain people, right? So, for instance, one of the things that I do in diversity work all the time, I have some challenges in my university, but every university has these challenges, to listen, what, are, what mandates are we giving our contractors, right? So you, you, uh, you want... A hundred million dollar contract. You want a twenty million dollar contract to build this, to build that, to create that. Well, I need to ask you: Who are you hiring? Do you have any percentage of of ex offenders? We need to make sure that you have a two percent of ex, of ex offenders. We need to make sure you have ten percent of minorities, right? Before you, that bid needs to include that. Right? Don't come to me saying, "Well, we're going to work on it." Wait, work on it, then then give me the bid. Well, could it be an option for them to include that? Um, because I think in contracting and stuff like that, it's, it's the most important thing is to have the most skilled person for the job. Um, so, so if someone goes and says, "I want to build your roof," you know, here's how much it's going to cost to build your mm -hmm. roof. They they're more than welcome to include who they hire, who they employ. Um, but what I care about most is someone who's going to hire someone to fix my roof. How much skill do you have doing roofs? No, I agree with you, brother. I, I, I think that uh, the roof is, you know, I would consider in, in this conversation, I would consider uh, the roof as a, cost, um, as a subcontractor, right? I'm thinking if I'm building a building, right? The roof is just one sure. aspect of it, right? Sure. I got the roof, I got the drywall, I got the painting, I got the electricity, I got all that kind of stuff. But in that sense, right, I'm still going to ask the question, well, who is the roofing company you're working with? Are you working with more than one to get the bid in, right? And so even as a, even as a, even as a subcontractor, I want to know, you know, have you reached out to, 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 to minority sub? I mean, um, to, to minority roofing companies. Uh, even if you haven't, okay, that's, that's one conversation. In, in, I mean, in, in, in those roofing companies, I ask the question: Do you have a policy as it relates to the recruiting and the and the hiring of ex-offenders? 
Are you, are you trying to tell me they can't build nothing for you? And th- they sit up here across the country, and especially in Ohio, building desks, building tables, building license plates, sure. building b- building cars, and yet they can't build your roof, right? So what do you worry about? They gonna steal some some planks? <laughs> steal some not some? Wait, wait, wait. What do you worry about, right? So so my question is: Are we tapping into human potential? Are we holding businesses accountable? And then we hold them accountable. I think then we can start seeing the manifestation of a of a state that invests in human capital. So I think that's what we, we need to hold our companies accountable. We need to make sure our contracts that we're bidding out to have a bid that is diverse. And diverse means obviously racial and 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 gender and and and, and physical ability and maybe sexual orientation, but it also includes exceptional. I think when it comes to reform, we can't sit up here. And this last thing I say, we can't sit ourselves, sit up here and call ourselves the state of Ohio and their Department of Rehabilitation and Correction if there's no R in that conversation. If we're if the R is a little R <laughs> and a big C, then we're not. When when those individuals become ex offenders, we haven't trained them to be citizens. We haven't trained them to be, you know, sort of reentry into our society. And that is an indictment of us. That's not an indictment of the inmate. The inmate did their time. The question is, we failed the inmate to prepare the inmate to be ready to come sit in an interview with you. Right, Right? the rehabilitation piece. So again, how do we, like OIC, is there other organizations that are a part of the rehabilitation piece? Right, so, so so I'm not familiar with, with 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 all the names of them. I know I, I sit in meetings with people who do that, uh, 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 and, and so I couldn't at this moment quote those those organizations. But I do know that that, that they are certainly uh, in Clark County uh, as well as Montgomery County, where I know a little bit more uh, uh, in terms of organizations who have reentry official reentry programs where they include the you know issues of of resume writing, issues of interviewing, questions of how to present yourself that kind of thing, right? But then more so, you have churches, right? You have some churches, uh, you know, for instance, you know, the church that I administrate in, in Illinois, we have churches that actually have programs that we get state dollars to make sure that we have ex-offenders on the payroll, right? Hmm. So when it comes down to when we're, how do, how do we move our, our food, when, you know, when a food truck comes, when we're giving out food on the weekends or during the week, right? Who's unloading the crates, right? Who's cleaning the who's 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 cleaning the areas, right? Who's helping disperse this type of stuff, right? So churches can make that investment as well. And what other place to have that investment? And with our churches, right? And so I think that uh, uh, to answer your question again, I, I think that we need to hold all of us accountable. Where do we fit in in this whole thing of society? What access to employment do we have? We may not have our own business, but we work for a company like Wittenberg. We work for a company like the city of, uh, uh, of Springfield. We work for uh, the Department of Housing. We, you know, and what are we asking our bosses? Hey, what are we doing? What kind of programs do we have, right? Can I create a sub-program within our department to go work with ex-offenders to make sure they're ready? If we don't have it, let's build it, right? That's the kind of leadership I think we need at the local level and at the state level, that whatever we don't have as a systematic state program that invests in the human capital people, it is our job to make it. I think that's, that's key. Is that one of going to be one of your main platforms that you'll be running on in 2022? Platforms that I'm <laughs> running on. <laughs> Brother Arthur, man, you're doing too much, man. You know, I think this. I think that uh, Ohio certainly um, demands and um, sort of um, – expects accountability, um, proven leadership, um, and I would argue uh, caring leadership, right? I think when we think of what just happened on Wednesday with the, you know, uh, the, 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 the House of Representatives guy, you know, $60 million, $60 you know, million. Uh, uh, just extorting that and bribing that, you know. When we think about stuff and the kind of distrust that's going to continue to create, let alone we got a national government, that's impacting our states and this argument over wear a mask, not to wear a mask, are the numbers real, not real? We have citizens who are growingly distrusting of government. Whatever I do in this next election is going to be a conversation of, listen, you can check my track record. You can certainly realize that I'm a trustworthy individual, 
but I operate out of the heart. I'm not a career politician. I, I got a good job. as a, I'm a seasoned professor. I, I got awards. I got all this kind of, I've written books. I, this is what I do. I said, I'm here to serve, right? I think it was Plato who says, listen, quite frankly, us philosophers, we don't want to rule, right? I don't want to do this thing, right? But the reality is who else knows justice? Who else knows love? Who else knows the character of justice? Temperance, courage, right? Then a philosopher. Who else knows how to put people in conversation? Left, right, center, around issues that matter and around conversation that have direct impact than a philosopher. So I think, Brother Arthur, I think that when it comes to whatever I do in 2022, I think Ohio can expect um, that, that Julius Bailey is going to be a leader um, that fundamentally cares about the human investment, that cares about the restoration of hope, and that certainly, certainly engages in a conversation of your potential. If I am not the kind of person that wants, if I'm not the kind of person that invests in leadership, potential, and actuality, then I'm not doing my job, right? Because it was people that invested in the potential of me. It was people that invested in the potential of you. And I don't have the capacity I'm not hypocritical enough to then avoid or to stave off the investment in other people. So a criminal justice would be something that certainly I'll be talking about. Um, but I'm an educator, right? So I'm very concerned about education. I'm very concerned about workers' rights. I'm, I'm very concerned about the ways in which, you know, uh, we create sort of, uh, um, um, sort of uh, uh, wages and how wages affect poverty and how poverty is linked to education and how cyclical poverty then adversely affects the, the, the soul of a city and the soul of a state, right? So I'm, I'm working this, well, whatever I do in 2020, 2020 is about reaching the heart and the soul, right? I'm going to let the politicians do what the politicians do. They're going to sell y'all a bill of goods. They're going to throw some money your way. But then there's going to be a voice out there that's going to say, what about this issue that affects the spirit and the soul of what you're doing in every state from Toledo and Lima on down to, you know, to Cincinnati on a cross here to Dayton, way up there, in, you know, in Sandusky. What is the soul of our state? What Julius Bailey is going to try to put forward uh, is 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 trying to speak to the soul of Ohio. Wow, guys, this guy is a mover and a shaker. I think I want to mention one other thing though. You had told me you've been trying to set up a couple of appointments with some representatives <laughs> to talk about some of these important ideas. This stuff that we're talking about, this stuff needs to be talked about, and. Uh, you had threw, threw around a couple of names, Kyle Kohler. You've been trying to meet with him and, and Jim Jordan. So if you guys are watching, reach out to Dr. Bailey. I think we need to have some conversations. I think so. so. I mean, obviously, Kyle, you know, he's my representative, right? And so, you know, I respect, you know, him as our representative. Uh, I thank him for the work that he's done. Um, but there are some fundamental if issues that I have um, with some of the decisions that he's made since I've been here in Springfield um, and I'm concerned about that as it relates to, especially not exclusively, but as it relates to women, as it relates to minority communities. I'm concerned about that. And so I would like to, I've, 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 I've tagged Kyle. I've called his office. I've put him on Twitter and Facebook blast. Meet me. I'll meet you at the church. I'll meet you at the, in the corner. Right. I'll meet you wherever you want to. You can come to Wittenberg. He was just at Wittenberg for our opening of the steamer, Right. And my president, you know, I ain't gonna tell you, but people are like, <laughs> leave him alone. I'm like, no, I need to go all in. <laughs> yeah, so him, but quite frankly, I think the person that, that I think I would love to sit down with uh, is Jim Jordan. I think that, you know, he is our respective senator. Um, he is um, a, a mover and a shaker for real. Uh, I think that if I can look into his eye, if I can um, get him to know who Julius Bailey is, even though I know there's party differences and all that old crazy stuff. Again, I'm operating not on party politics. I'm operating on soul and heart. And I believe that the heart of Jim Jordan, and I believe that, that talking to a Julius Bailey can reach the heart. And, 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 and just like the word says, what comes from the heart reaches the heart. And so that's what a Julius Bailey candidacy would mean. And to meet with powerful people like them uh, 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 is, is going to be something that's going to, sort of define what uh, my candidacy would be. Well, you got a lot of powerful ideas. That's all the questions I got, Tim. 
No, I mean, we, I think we covered it all, man. It was nice meeting you. You Dr. too, brother. So, you too, brother. Dr. Bailey, any closing closing thoughts? No, I just want to thank y'all for what you're doing. You know, I watch uh, the investments that you do, the housing that you do. Obviously, this podcast, we're talking about all type of business and social matters. Um, so it reminds us, you know, in what Ohio can be, right? You have people who are business people who are certainly not just concerned about, you know, the creation, sort of capitalistic creation of dollars. Yes, they're concerned about that, but how dollars are invested and reinvested. Absolutely. Right? And I think that's what I come to the table with, and that's why I align myself with you, not just because you're an alum of my institution, and I got to be cool with you. <laughs> Fly the W, Tiger up, that kind of stuff. But no, but I think it's because I see your heart, and I see the work that you do. And the work that you do. So when I watch your podcast, when I, 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 I and, and, and then when I watch you every day working on behalf of Springfield and Beaver Creek in this area, I know that there are hundreds of Tims and Arthurs across the state, and I want to connect with those. Kids. Absolutely. And I want to be a part of the work they're doing so that I can help you, and you can help me to tap into the potential uh, uh, and the actual uh, human investment and human capital. So Amen. thank you for this time. Yeah, definitely you, appreciate it. You. And you can find uh, Dr. Bailey. He's got his own podcast, Straight No Chaser with Dr. Bailey. Uh, I think you're going to have uh, Dr. Cornell West on Cor August Cor Cornell 3rd. Cornell West to be on on August 3rd. Um, Eddie Glaude, um, who we see on MSNBC, the chair of African American Studies at Princeton. He'll be on on August 10th. Um, we have an important conversation coming up this Monday with a fellow um, WIT alum, um, Shakir Abdullah. He used to play football, was our former... Um, a board of trustee member. Now he's a vice president of student affairs at Clayton State in Georgia. He'll be on on Monday talking about issues of diversity in higher education. So, so my podcast is uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, 11 a.m. On is, is if, if you're on Facebook, a straight note chaser with Dr. Julius Bailey. If you're on YouTube, just to just to just subscribe to Dr. Julius Bailey channel. Uh, obviously, I'm just proud to be here at this studio. I'm gonna have some conversation with Brother Eric, and you know who knows, you know whatever official announcement I might make <laughs> might happen right here at this desk. You know <laughs> who knows, but I thank all of you. I thank you. We definitely appreciate your time, guys. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Solomon Hustles. <laughs>